All right, hello, welcome everyone to the November 2021 edition of Urgent Care Town Hall presented by California Urgent Care Association. The, uh, these monthly town halls are presented free of charge to anyone interested in furthering the cause of the urgent care industry here in California and throughout the country. My name is Claudio Varga and I will be your host for today's presentation. The, uh, these monthly town halls um, are meant to educate and uh, decipher and discuss mm -hmm. contemporary issues and topics pertaining to the urgent care industry here in California and nationally. And uh, we welcome suggestions for speakers or topics in the future. You can find out more about our future presentations and uh, presenters by looking us up on the web at caluca.org. That's C-A-L-U-C-A.org. If you have uh, suggestions for speakers or topics, you can email us directly as well at info at caluca.org. Today, we have a, a terrific presentation. We have with us Dr. Patrick O'Malley. Dr. O'Malley is a board certified emergency physician uh, in South Carolina with over 15 years of ER and urgent care experience. He's an uh, inventor, an innovator, uh, has produced uh, numerous products and techniques for uh, related to laceration management, which is our topic today. Uh, he has, is a national speaker and has presented numerous occasions at uh, conferences and conventions uh, nationally. And uh, so during, uh, right just now I'm going to, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. O'Malley and uh, just a quick heads up. Um, we will have question and answer uh, period after Dr. O'Malley's presentation. Uh, please be sure and use the chat function uh, here to submit questions. I will be monitoring those and preparing questions for Dr. O'Malley at the conclusion. And uh, as well, he's got this fantastic uh, laceration, uh, 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 what are we going to call it? It's uh, it's your uh, your uh, what, what, what do you call it? Of course, it's your a, course, a, the course, a, a course, CME course it, for laceration. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it, it's fantastic, and uh, and uh, we've got some <clears throat> staff members already that are they're working their way through it. So uh, the feedback is fantastic. There's a special discount for anyone viewing this seminar, which we're going to make you wait till the end of this fantastic presentation today, and you're going to get that discount code. So be sure and stick around all the way to the end. So, Dr. Malley, I'm going to turn it over to you. Why don't you take a minute or two and uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself, and then uh, sure. we're very anxious to see your presentation. Thanks. Absolutely. Well, first, first and foremost, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to you about this. This is a, a, a subject matter that I'm passionate about. I, uh, I think lacerations are one of the things that brought me into uh, the specialty of emergency medicine. And um, I just want to be able to share some helpful tips and, uh, and pearls of wisdom that I've uh, collected over the years and to go through some high yield topics that I think are going to improve your practice and allow for you to hopefully be able to provide better patient care. So I'm going to start the share screen here and we will get started. Okay, so the lacerationcourse.com uh, is the website, and we'll talk a little bit more about the course uh, at, at, the, at the end. So again, my name is Patrick O'Malley. I'm an uh, ER doc. I'm pretty much have lived my entire life in the southeast, uh, North Carolina and South Carolina. Uh, and as Claudio had mentioned, um, you know, I'm, I'm passionate about this and spend a fair amount of time um, you know, talking to others about um, laceration management. So for the, uh, I think my thing is a little bit screwy here. Okay, now I think we've got it. All right, so the objectives of this uh, webinar today, we've got about 45, 50 minutes that we're going to try to go through some of this stuff kind of quickly. But uh, my main objective for you is for you to be able to take home some valuable points and pearls that uh, will allow you to improve your patient care and increase your confidence in managing lacerations. We've got four blocks in the talk. Uh, some of these overlap a little bit, uh, but first we're going to talk about some bad practice habits and myths, uh, discuss some helpful products and devices and concepts, some pearls of wisdom and advanced techniques, and then lastly we're going to go through some of the medical legal side of laceration management in urgent care. So as Claudio mentioned, we're going to take some questions at the end. You can send them over to him and then we'll go through those. Um, I do have some videos that are referenced in the discussion today. And those videos can be found on the uh, on my YouTube channel, which is uh, aptly named The Laceration Course. 
Um, I do have a couple of documents that uh, that will be emailed out to you along with uh, some some more detail on the the questions that you provide. Um, I've got a little cheat sheet and the links to the articles that are discussed today in the talk. So why are we talking about this? Well, you know, lacerations are a very common reason for patients coming to the emergency department and for urgent care. Um, unfortunately, it's not uncommon for urgent care to refer patients over to the emergency department for, you know, sometimes simple lacerations. And my goal is to get you more comfortable and confident with doing this. And the reason is, is several fold. One, first and foremost, with the patient being the, uh, the, the main reason, it's costly um, in, in time and in money when they have to go from urgent care to the emergency department. And um, they're not too happy with it oftentimes if it's a, a very simple laceration that could easily be, be managed. And if you think about it, if they're being sent away from you for this, they're gonna have second thoughts when it comes to going to you in the first place. So whenever you're referring a patient away for a simple laceration, it may end up costing you uh, future visits and future revenue. And bottom line is that we can all do these things, all right, in the urgent care setting, the majority of lacerations that will walk through your door, you can handle. So let's get started and go through some, uh, some, some good stuff. All right, so the first section is some myths and bad practice habits. All of these that you see listed here, we're gonna go through these. And again, I'm gonna provide some supporting evidence so that you can look it up, dig a little bit deeper if you'd like. Uh, the first is sterile field. And let me just, there we go. Um, the whole concept of sterile field, I think that comes from our surgical colleagues and the concept that we really have to make everything sterile. Well, with lacerations and abscess, it's a dirty wound to start with me putting on a sterile gown or making the area uh, you know, excessively clean is not really going to make that laceration less dirty. Now, I think it's important to have good practice and use the sterile drapes that may come in your single-use laceration kits and trying to keep the patient's hand and their clothing and their hair away from the area that you're working. But by and large, you know, we're not in an operating room here. So the, the concept of sterile field is something that you don't have to uh, uh, spend too much time and, and worry about. Now, sterile water. Um, tap water is completely safe. It's a lot cheaper. Uh, a bottle of saline, a liter bottle is around $1.50, depending on who your uh, purchasing organization is. Uh, but tap water is completely safe. There are numerous studies that show with out any uh, plenty of studies right, uh, that show that uh, you can use tap water instead of sterile uh, saline or sterile water for irrigation of wounds. Now, after you anesthetize the wound, you can have the patient stand at the sink um, and run the tap water over the wound for a minute or two. That provides ample uh, irrigation uh, volume and pressure to be able to irrigate the wound out. You can give them some gauze and they can uh, you know, wipe off any dried blood in the area of the wound. So bottom line is that sterile water is not necessary. Tap water is completely safe and effective uh, with no difference in infection rates. Sterile gloves, this is another one. Sterile gloves, they're, they fit better, uh, but they're not necessary. They're not essential uh, because again, this is not a sterile procedure. Uh, the cost difference for sterile gloves versus the clean gloves that come in a box is quite significant. One source that I found showed, you know, $2.30 for a pair of sterile gloves versus seven cents for a pair of gloves that come out of the box. Uh, bottom line is that you can safely use the clean gloves that come in a box. Uh, and again, there's no difference in infection rate when using those clean gloves as compared to sterile gloves. Now, if you just like the fit of them better, sure, by all means, continue to use them, but you don't have to. Here's another one that we hear in our training, uh, using epinephrine in the fingers. Um, you know, that's, that's one of the things that sometimes gets passed down to us. Uh, the fingers, nose, penis, and toes, the areas that you're not supposed to use epinephrine. Well, come to find out that that's just not true. All right, uh, there are numerous studies, uh, Cochrane database reviews. Uh, the reason that, they, that that mantra uh, started was because there was a concern for digital necrosis. And what they found is that that's not the case. It doesn't happen. Uh, orthopedic surgeons, plastic surgeons routinely use uh, lidocaine with epinephrine or butivacaine with epinephrine 
whenever they are doing work on the fingers. Um, it provides for a longer action of anesthetic, and it also helps with controlling the bleeding. Now, the caveat to that is if you do have a patient with Raynaud's disease, Raynaud's phenomenon, or known peripheral artery disease uh, in the upper extremities, then sure, you may not want to use it in those. But for, you know, by and large, uh, the majority of patients that we're going to be seeing, it is safe to use epinephrine in the fingers whenever you've got a laceration or doing a digital block. All right, another one. Uh, povidone iodine or betadine or hexidine and hydrogen peroxide. Um, in all the places that I've worked over the years, it's not uncommon to, to, uh, to walk into a room and see a patient with their hand or their foot or whatever body part sitting in a tub of um, uh, you know, water and betadine or a tub of chlorhexidine with water mixed in. Um, you know, I, th I think that that too comes kind of from the, the surgical mindset. You've got to get this thing you know, cleaned out with, with those extra chemicals. And the bottom line is that there's no benefit um, with those chemicals in preventing infection. Um, there's no, it, it, they're felt to be safe, but they're not necessary. So there's no strong recommendation that those chemicals are better than water alone. So if there's no strong recommendation that it's better, then why use it? Uh, in my own personal experience, I always, you know, I'll, I'll walk in the room and there might be a, one of the little medicine cups that comes in the single use laceration kit. And for some reason, those things always tend to tip over whenever they're full of betadine. They make a mess. Uh, you know, it's, it's extra steps, it's extra expense. Uh, so bottom line is that, you know, those things are not essential. If you want to use them, that's, it, it's fine. There's not felt to be any harm, but they're not necessary. Uh, however, hydrogen peroxide should never be used. Uh, it's tissue toxic, tissue cidal, and uh, we should not be using hydro hydrogen peroxide for the cleansing or irrigation of wounds in the acute setting. All right, another one that's uh, you know kind of uh, controversial. We see a lot of myths. There's um, you know different practice patterns, different practice habits, but the bottom line is that prophylaxis for your run-of-the-mill laceration is not needed. Um, it does depend on the situation, and there are certain instances where providing antibiotics for laceration is warranted. Uh, and some of those may include whenever there's a prolonged presentation after the time of injury. Uh, the location, lower extremities tend to have a higher infection rate. Comorbidities such as peripheral vascular disease, uh, immunosuppression, patients on chronic steroids, things like that. So those are you know times where you may want to consider uh, providing some antibiotic prophylaxis. Um, another one that comes up uh, very frequently and pretty much every time that I you know, see a patient with a dog bite, um, I go to uh, the internet trying you know, up to date or other resources and, and, and review this myself. Um, you know, for cat bites, yes, always. Cat bites can turn nasty very, very quickly. So it is recommended to provide antibiotics for cat bites, but dog bites are a little bit different, uh, a little bit different story. Um, this link right here through rebelem.com is fantastic, and I'd encourage you to, uh, to take a look at that. Um, but overall, um, it's, it's believed that we overprescribe antibiotics for laceration, and interestingly, patient satisfaction, at least in this study, they looked at patient satisfaction, and there was found to be no um, association with patient satisfaction scores for patients who did or did not receive uh, antibiotics. So this is another thing that we can we can challenge ourselves on. We can take a look at it and say, you know what, do I need to be providing this patient uh, antibiotics for their uh, run-of-the-mill laceration? All right, irrigation. Here's another one where it's more of a bad practice habit than, uh, than myths. Um, in general, uh, irrigation is a, is, a, is a topic that I've spent a lot of time on. Um, and there are a lot of old recommendations that have been around since the 70s and 80s. Um, and not a whole lot of evidence to, to overly support it. But a couple of things I just want to point out is that uh, whenever you are irrigating a wound, uh, kind of a rule of thumb is 50 to 100 cc's or mLs per centimeter of laceration. So a five centimeter laceration should be irrigated with 250 to 500 mLs of water. Um, it is recommended that you generate somewhere in the area of 10 to 15 PSI. The difficulty is how do you measure that? Uh, that's another thing that I've spent a lot of time on, uh, and it's very difficult. Um, 
But in general, it's felt that if you're using a syringe and a splash guard and you're providing moderate pressure on the plunger as you're pushing down, you're generating the required or the recommended uh, pressure to be able to properly irrigate a wound. Uh, one thing that you should not be doing is taking a bottle of saline and punching holes in the top of it with an 18 gauge needle and squeezing. That has been found over and over again to not produce the amount of pressure that's generated. And it's also very tiring to your hands. So what I do is I use a 60 cc syringe. And the reason I do that is because it's more efficient. If you're using a smaller syringe, it's just, you, you have to pull, uh, pull up a lot more times with the syringe and a uh, 60 cc syringe and a splash guard is really the, the way to go with that. This article right here is from the International Journal of Emergency Medicine. It's got a great overview of some wound care topics and it, it talks about the, uh, the irrigation stuff. All right, so knot tying. This is one where it's in the bad practice habit category. Um, and even with myself, this is, uh, I, I've overlooked this for a long time. And um, I want you just to look at the images over here on the right and the importance of doing a good surgeon's knot. And the reason that we do this is we want to square the knot so that when it comes down over the wound, it's squared and it's less likely to unravel. So every time you're making a throw or you're tying a knot, you wanna go in the opposite direction each time. And that allows those, uh, the, the throws to lay down on top of each other and be more secure and less likely to unravel. Um, I did this with some rope in the garage and you can see when it's done incorrectly, uh, just how, how uh, unstable that knot is uh, compared to the one on the right when you're going in opposite directions. And it really allows you to be able to square that down. And here's a little close up um, with a, a silicone pad and some suture material. Um, you can see how the incorrect, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't lay down nicely. And on the right side, um, those knots which are being thrown in opposite directions allow for that knot to be more, uh, more squared, more secure and uh, less likely to unravel. So I challenge yourself uh, or challenge you next time you're tying knots to really focus on that technique of going in opposite directions each time you do your, uh, your instrument tie. All right, so that's the first little section. If you've got any questions, please send them over to Claudio and we'll, uh, we'll address those at the end. The, the next two sections are kind of like must have products and concepts. There is a little bit of overlap uh, with some of the techniques. Um, but I do want to, uh, to say that there are different options. I'm not endorsing a single product at all whatsoever. And I don't want you to run to your clinic uh, director and say, hey, O'Malley said that we have to have this. That's not the case. But I just want to introduce some concepts and some things that I think are helpful from an urgent care perspective when managing lacerations. All right, so we're going to go through all of these here and briefly talk about them. All right, trauma shears. These are great to have. Um, you can get them for five bucks on Amazon. Uh, you can probably spend upwards of $200 if you want the uh, you know, high-end EMS firefighter, indestructible, you know, smash through windows type of thing. But these are great to have when you're cutting through, you need to cut through clothes. A uh, patient comes in with a, you know, an extremity that's all taped and gauzed up and you wanna be able to cut through that, cutting through splinting material. Great thing for you to have. You can keep them in your bag at work. Uh, but very useful. Lighting, here's another one. Um, along with having good, uh, a pair of reading glasses if your eyes are aging and failing like mine are, uh, but it's, it's good to have um, a light source. Um, an overhead light is not readily available in every single treatment room uh, in the urgent care world, um, but you have to be able to see. And if you can't see, it really does make it more difficult to be able to repair a laceration. And, you know, you're trying to grasp a little tiny needle as it comes through the, uh, the, the, the skin and it's, it's covered in blood. Uh, and a rechargeable headlamp is a great little thing that you can have. Um, one of my partners bought one of these and we just keep it over at our workstation and share it. Um, you know, these things are relatively inexpensive and they're great to, uh, to, to be able to have. And you can find them on Amazon, like everything. All right, here's another one, uh, a little measuring tape or a ruler. Um, the reason that this is important is for documentation. Uh, billing and coding, uh, it's important, it's essential to have accurate information so that you can get reimbursed for the work that you do. Uh, reimbursement when it comes to lacerations uh, is very dependent on the length. 
and if you are inaccurately measuring or you're putting down the incorrect length, then that can affect your billing and coding. So there's a lot of different ways that you can do this. You can get one of these little, uh, you know, retractable uh, measuring tapes. You can keep it on your badge in your in your coat pocket. Uh, you can also get a huge stack of uh, paper rulers that are very inexpensive. Uh, but whatever method you you have, make sure that you've got some way to be able to accurately measure uh, laceration abscess size, uh, the extent of cellulitis when it's present. Um, here's another uh, very important thing. Um, again, this is not, there's, there's a lot of different ways to go about um, attaining um, hemostasis whenever there's an injury to a finger that's bleeding, uh, but it's really important to have a bloodless field whenever you're repairing lacerations to the finger. Uh, there's several different ways you can do this. You can take an elastic band from the base of the glove, wrap that around the, the base of the finger. You can use gauze, a pin rose drain, and just clamp it down uh, with the hemostat. You can also, the, the bottom picture here, you can also take a glove, uh, put it on the hand, and snip the end of the, the affected finger, and then simply just roll that down to the base of the finger, and that also provides for a finger tourniquet option. And then of course, there are some commercially available uh, versions of this as well. Ring removal, um, not so much a product, but just a concept um, more, more than anything. Whenever you see a patient that's got an injury to the extremity, um, especially the hand or the fingers, look at their fingers. That should be one of the first things that you do, almost like a reflex. Look at their fingers. If they have any rings, remove them. Uh, there's a lot of different techniques that are out there. The biggest thing is to not damage the tissue. And I think that that's important, kind of like with the dental floss technique, that can actually um, induce quite a bit of trauma to the soft tissue and actually make swelling worse if you're unsuccessful with, with getting the ring off. Um, the little images over here on the side, I know that a premature, you know, a preemie baby or infant um, blood pressure cuff is probably not readily available in the urgent care setting. But if you, if, whatever reason, if you're able to, to get access to one of these, you can kind of play around with that, hook it up to a syringe, wrap it around the finger, blow it up with the syringe um, to provide pressure to the finger for a few minutes. And then um, that will help reduce the edema um, on the finger and you can easily remove the, uh, the ring. There is a commercial version that's available for this, but uh, the, the biggest thing is just the concept of whenever there's rings present on injured hands uh, or fingers, make sure that you get those off. All right, cyanoacrylate or dermabond or glue. I think for the, the next few little products here, uh, most urgent cares are gonna have these. I just want you to be familiar with them and, uh, and, and try using them out because they're, they are very valuable. Uh, dermabond um, is, is very helpful, obviously for the little small lacerations, you know, especially with kids, uh, but you can also use them for fingertip avulsions. Uh, you can see the link down here. Uh, you can also use those for elderly patients with skin tears. Uh, you can combine Dermabond and Steri-Strips for extra, um, extra hold, extra uh, support and tension. Uh, and the advantage is that it comes off on its own. It's not essential for the patient to, it should be urgent care visit for suture removal. Um, it, they don't have to come back in for a recheck. Uh, you know, the Dermabond is going to slough off on its own. So it does save patients that hassle of, of having to come back. Stapler. Um, if you are not very familiar with using the stapler, it's a, it, it's a great tool to have at your disposal, uh, especially for the scalp. I've always found it very difficult to do sutures on the scalp, especially when there's a significant amount of hair, which for most people there, there is. Um, but staples are fast. Uh, they provide excellent hold. They're, you know, they're much less likely to pop out or come unravel the sutures can. Uh, there's a similar cosmetic outcome uh, with looking at uh, staples compared to sutures, but there is a difference in quality. Uh, just make sure that if, if you're using the, the, the smaller stapler that's seen on the right here, uh, just practice with it because that they, they are a little bit less reliable. Um, so just make sure that you're, you're comfortable with using a stapler. Um, again, very, very uh, effective for scalp lacerations. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. All right, lastly is stair strips. Um, if you haven't used stair strips, I encourage you to try it. Um, there are more and more uh, physicians in the emergency medicine literature that are advocating the use of stair strips for lacerations. 
Um, but the, the biggest thing is that you have to have the Benzwin, uh, the little ampules or swabs of the glue that allows the stereo strips to stick to the skin. Um, you can place stereo strips parallel to the wound and actually suture through it. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that later. You can combine with glue. And again, these things are being advocated for more and more. Um, if you don't have that much experience with stereo strips, try it out and, uh, and, and see what your, uh, your experience is with that. All right, so the next little section is tricks of the trade. So we're gonna talk about a handful of little um, uh, techniques that, uh, that may be helpful for you. All right, so a bleeding varicose vein. We see these on occasion. Um, I actually had a patient recently who got sent from their internal medicine office. Um, and I was literally in the room for about a minute and just put a simple figure of eight suture on the varicose vein and the patient left. So I think that this is something that, you know, that we as urgent care clinicians definitely have to be able to do. Uh, and there's a, several different techniques that can be used. Um, if you have lidocaine and epinephrine, you can either inject that into the area and that will cause some vasoconstriction. You can also saturate a gauze um, with the lidocaine and epinephrine, or if you have tranexamic acid, um, and then put that under like a little bottle cap, wrap it with some Coban or some tape to provide a little bit of pressure. And sometimes that's all you need. Uh, again, the figure of eight suture is a wonderful little trick to, to have at your disposal, not only for the bleeding varicose vein, but you can also use that if you have a patient um, who's had a recent um, uh, heart catheterization, arterial line, if they've had a uh, central line that's been removed and you got a little bit of, uh, of oozing, just a simple figure of eight suture is a great little trick uh, to help with those types of uh, situations. All right, hairy areas. Um, unfortunately, I'm not having to deal with that as much as I uh, used to, but uh, you know, on the face, um, uh, patients with significant facial hair, mustache, beards, and whatnot, um, as a favor to your nursing colleagues or your, your partners who will be removing any sutures when they come back, uh, try to use the proline or the blue thread instead of the ethylon or, or, or black colored thread. And the reason being is that um, finding black sutures in black facial hair uh, is very difficult. Another thing is to, to leave the tails whenever you're, you're doing the repair, leave the tails a little bit longer so that they're easier to identify and easier to grab uh, and you're not grabbing their you know, mustache hairs uh, whenever you're trying to get the, uh, the sutures removed. And again, in the scalp, if you can use staples, they're great, they're fast, and uh, you don't have this issue of uh, trying to find sutures in, in hairy areas. Scalp wounds, you know, we're, they're pretty common. We see scalp lacerations pretty frequently. Um, the skin of the scalp is very thick. And in my experience, I always have a hard time anesthetizing that thick uh, scalp tissue. Uh, with a small needle trying to, you know, push anesthetic into it. Uh, if the wound is, you know, relatively small, another little trick that you can do is just take an ice pack and put that on there for maybe five minutes. Uh, you can come in, you can irrigate, you can put the ice pack back down, come back in a few minutes later and just put a couple of staples in. And from what patients tell me, you know, one or two staples hurts about the same as injecting local anesthetic. So they're, they're, they're very open to that. Um, another little technique, which I'm not a huge fan of, but just to, to make you aware of it, you can look up the hair apposition technique and the image over here on the side uh, for you know, relatively small scalp lacerations. You can take hairs on either side of the laceration, kind of twist them together and then wrap them around. You can use uh, the needle driver and the hemostats to kind of wrap those around each other, pull them down and then apply a little drop of Dermabond. To me, this is a little bit cumbersome and I've, I've never had that much success with it, but just kind of throwing it out there is another, uh, another mechanism of an ouchless mechanism of uh, scalp laceration repair, maybe for, uh, for young children, if you want to try that out. All right, so here's one, here's a patient that I saw just recently uh, last week uh, who ran into the side of a tractor and had like a, a 20 centimeter scalp laceration. Um, I just recently heard about this little technique of using Surgilube, you know, that we use for digital rectal exams, uh, and putting that in um, dried, uh, you know, clotted blood that's uh, that's in hair from the these types of lacerations, 
And I was very surprised it worked very well. So if you ever have a patient that comes in, they've got this dried blood, you know, clotted blood in their hair, kind of a matted mess, uh, use a little packet or two of the surgery lube and you can massage that in and it helps remove and loosen up that blood. All right, large volume irrigation. Now this may not be something that you see every day or overly frequent, but if you do have a large laceration, um, you know, the, the most important aspect is to really get it irrigated. And if you're going to be putting a lot of water into wound, it causes a mess. Um, you know, having high capacity chucks or the diapers, you know, whatever you've got, you may have to just use towels if, um, if, if need be. But there's two things that you can, uh, you can try. You can use a trash bag or one of the patient belongings bag uh, and put the extremity into that bag with the diaper. And then you can really irrigate uh, an area out with a larger volume of water and it reduces the mess. Uh, this can be done for the extremities. You can actually do it around the scalp or the head. Um, it collects the fluid, then you throw it away. Um, another technique, and all urgent cares may not have suction catheter, uh, you know, apparatus or setup. Uh, if you don't, fine. If you do, you can also just take a suction catheter and put it in close proximity to the wound so that whenever the water that you're using for irrigation comes off, uh, you can collect that and it just sucks it into the uh, suction catheter. Um, on the YouTube channel, there is a video that, uh, that demonstrates the technique with the, um, the patient belongings bag, uh, if you want to check that out. All right, so here's some of the advanced techniques. Again, some of these have the YouTube videos, uh, if you want to go and, and take a closer look. But we'll go through some of these here, if I can get the screen. All right, an intrathecal nerve block. I just learned about this recently myself and have become a huge fan of it. Um, I don't know what y'all use whenever you're doing a digital block. I think the traditional teaching is to do two injections on either side of the affected finger. Um, that's two injections. It takes a little bit longer, but this intrathecal nerve block uh, is a great technique. It's a single injection and you're going at the volar palmar crease uh, and just a, a standard, uh, um, uh, infiltration technique, uh, but putting you know, several cc's, maybe three or four cc's of anesthetic uh, in that one area, and that infiltrates all the way around the finger and provides excellent um, uh, anesthesia. So again, there's a YouTube video if you want to take a look at that, uh, but great technique. I encourage you to check it out and, uh, and, and try it. Oh. All right, so here's another one that I'm, I've become a huge fan of. Uh, combining steri strips and suture. And there's a couple different ways you can do that. You can put the steri strips in parallel to the wound and suture through. Uh, you can also put the uh, steri strip across the wound and then um, suture through that. And the reason that this is such a great technique, if you've got patients with thin skin um, and the wound may be under a lot of tension, uh, this is a great way to provide some extra reinforcement um, if the suture material is, is more likely to rip through the skin, uh, the steer strip kind of prevents that. So it's a, it's almost like a, an anchor, so to speak. Um, and I think the next slide. Yeah. All right. So this is a patient that I had recently that had a very large pre-tibial laceration. She got out of a car and hit the door and it just, it literally just ripped that skin. So after uh, she was anesthetized and irrigated out, uh, you could see that the tissue edges were still quite far apart. So what I did is use some benzoin and steri strips along the, uh, along the margins of the wound, and then uh, a number of horizontal mattress sutures with 3O proline to really be able to bring that together in, uh, in, in better alignment. Um, the picture on the left is at two weeks follow-up, and the picture on the right is four weeks follow-up. Uh, another little pearl for these is it is recommended that they, uh, the patient use crutches to try to limit weight bearing, uh, because any walking on that, that type of wound is more prone to open it up. Uh, so even a, you know, a, a splint and some crutches are another uh, important aspect of, of caring for those types of things. But the, the biggest thing is being able to combine steri strips and sutures together is an excellent technique to have at your disposal. All right, fingertip avulsions. These uh, can be uh, a little bit nerve wracking for us as, as clinicians. 
um, whenever you see wounds like this, you know, you want to make sure that there's not a fracture. Um, you know, using your digital box finger tourniquet, you can soak the finger in um, uh, lidocaine with epinephrine. Uh, if there is any intact tissue, you can actually just kind of tack that down, uh, either with a single, you know, one or two sutures or dermabond, uh, you know, covering with petroleum gauze, um, you know, applying pressure, keep elevated. And uh, it, it's also important to manage expectations with these. Um, you know, we don't want our patients to, to worry excessively, but, you know, so counseling them on the fact that it may continue to bleed and that, that that's okay. If it does, apply some pressure, they can change the bandage, keep it elevated. Um, but this fingertip avulsion technique, the link here is, uh, is, is really good. It's basically just using Dermabond, you know, having a bloodless field and then uh, using several layers of Dermabond over that area. Uh, which uh, protects it and um, allows that the, the tissue to kind of grow in. All right, so facial nerve blocks. Um, yeah, every urgent care is different. Um, one that I worked in, we saw some pretty high acuity stuff and it wasn't uncommon to have some pretty significant facial lacerations. Um, and being familiar with facial nerve blocks, the anatomy, uh, where essentially we're looking at the uh, superorbital, infraorbital, and mental nerves. Uh, the, uh, the infraorbital and the mental can be both performed intraorally or externally, and the uh, superorbital is, is done externally. So just you know, being familiar with this, whenever you've got a large laceration, um, you know, injecting local anesthetic directly into the wound is going to cause some tissue distortion. So facial nerves blocks are a great way to be able to provide uh, anesthesia to a large area. And this is on yours truly. Uh, just again, some of the, the landmarks there, you can see that it's um, the, uh, the external anatomy, the landmarks are in close proximity to the pupil, the midline of the pupil and go all the way down. Um, so th this is another important technique that uh, you should at least be familiar with. And if you want to try it out, uh, go for it. They're, they're great. Whoa. All right, so the next, you know, a little bit more advanced type stuff. Lip lacerations are another thing that can be very um, uh, intimidating to us. Uh, some of the tools that you need to have, you know, kind of at your disposal with this are, are the you know, utilizing the nerve blocks because they do uh, limit tissue distortion. Um, you can also do some, uh, you know, topical lidocaine and epinephrine or uh, let gel. Uh, if there is the presence of a broken tooth, consider getting an x-ray because we don't want to, you know, sew in a tooth fragment into a wound, which would serve as a nidus of infection. Um, the stepwise approach that you see on the right, essentially what we're trying to do is to align the vermilion border, then repair any muscular layer that may be damaged, and then the inner or wet mucosa layer, followed by the outer or dry lip uh, tissue. So for anything that's going to be under the skin or on the inside of the mouth, you're wanting to use an absorbable suture. And for the external aspect, you can use your, your non-absorbable uh, suture material. All right, so this is a patient that I had um, who had a, a nice lip laceration. And um, you know, the, the picture on the right is the alignment of the vermilion border. And then followed by on, on the left, you can uh, possibly see the the small uh, absorbable suture that's used for the muscle layer and then the internal and external aspects. So it really is just kind of a, a stepwise approach for this. Um, another, I guess kind of depending on where, where you live and where you practice, uh, but for some reason over the past month, I've seen several patients that have gotten fish hooks embedded in their, uh, in their hands. There are a ton of different techniques for this. Um, for this one in particular, I did put up uh, a couple of YouTube videos on the ones that I had seen. Uh, but what you want to do, you want to anesthetize the area. Um, if the barb of the fish hook is already pushed through the skin, it makes it a lot easier. You can just snip those with some wire cutters. Um, if the barb is embedded uh, and not visible, then what I typically do is anesthetize the area and then use an 11 blade scalpel just to kind of run down uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the hook and try to open that up and then use some hemostats to try and pull it out. The biggest thing is that you have to make that incision large enough so that the, uh, the, the hook can actually come out. But there are a couple of videos if you want to uh, take a closer look there. 
All right. Um, sorry about that. All right. So the next thing that we will talk about are some of the, the more complex ones like tissue bridges, flaps, uh, lacerations that are in close proximity and parallel. I think the main concept here is that you want to envision how the wound is going to come together. And sometimes I'll even take a little piece of paper and draw it out and kind of chart out my approach to this and see how the how I think that the wound is going to come together so that I've got that uh, in mind and I can get in there and, and do it. Um, not all plans come together as, as we sometimes hope, and you may have to even uh, remove a suture or two and, and start over and kind of adapt as the wound comes together. Uh, sometimes you may have to do a little bit of undermining or debridement, which are a little bit more complex procedures uh, and aspects um, which do increase the level of complexity of the wound. And sometimes you have to combine different things. You have to use some interrupted. You may have to use some subcuticular, deeper sutures or even mattress uh, techniques. Um, so we'll take a look at here. So here's a, a, a what I call a Y-shaped wound, uh, which we see these pretty commonly. And uh, you see tissue segments there, one, two, and three. Um, I refer to the number two segment right there as kind of the floppy end. That's what you're trying to get back into alignment. And this is almost like a, a modified uh, mattress suture. So you're gonna go in, your anchor suture is in uh, segment one, and then you're gonna go through kind of like the, the, the subcutic or the, the dermal layer in two, back in through three, and then tie it across. And as you're tying your knot, you know, you can, you can make small adjustments, uh, you know, pulling the threads uh, as they come together. And that, uh, that loose or floppy end should come into alignment there. And it's, it's one of those things where you just kind of have to play around with it a little bit, maybe a little bit more tension, a little bit less tension. Sometimes for these, you have to actually just cut the thread and, uh, and start over if it doesn't come together uh, nicely. But that's the, that's the way to approach these is try to get, um, that, uh, that central area repaired first, and then you can go out to the uh, periphery uh, and repair the other parts of the laceration. All right, um, again, on YouTube, I've got uh, a really good detailed explanation of a kind of a Y-shaped laceration uh, that you might find useful. And here we've got, you know, parallel lacerations. This is another one where, you know, you may or may not see in the urgent care setting um, I think the, the large uh, picture there at the bottom is probably more from somebody from self-mutilation, self-harm, cutting, and that type of thing. Um, but you know, somebody's arm may go through a window uh, and you can get a couple lacerations in close proximity. So the way to approach these is almost like a, again, like a modified uh, horizontal mattress suture. Um, the little, um, almost like tissue islands in between the lacerations, the blood flow to those may not be all that great. So you don't want to stick a bunch of sutures, you know, through those little tissue islands uh, because you may end up strangulating them and compromising their blood flow. So using kind of like a modified, like an extended horizontal mattress where you thread the needle through the dermal layer of each of those little tissue islands and then go down to the, uh, to the end of the wound and come back and then you, you, you tie it down at the, the same place where, the, uh, where your suture originated. And these really are fun to do. They come together very nicely. And um, you, know, you, can, you can try this out uh, you know, on, a, on a practice suture pad or a pig's foot or something like that to, uh, to get a little bit of experience and practice with that. All right, subungal hematoma. This is probably something that you've already seen. Um, they're very, very painful. And the reason that they're painful is the increased pressure um, uh, underneath the nail from the blood. Um, it's recommended that you drain these within 24 to 48 hours of onset. And um, what you can do is you can take an electric cautery or even just a, uh, an 18 gauge needle and bore a little hole in the nail uh, where the hematoma is. Uh, but it's important to put in two holes because if you only do one, uh, there's a chance that it may clot and reaccumulate and not be able to continue to drain. Another little pearl with this is whenever you do the first hole, there's gonna be blood that comes out, all right? When you're putting in the second hole, um, don't keep pushing deeper and deeper expecting more blood to come out because it's probably not going to. And if you go in too far, you're gonna hit the nail bed and they are going to scream. That's very, very painful. Uh, but try to put in two holes, but don't go digging deeper and deeper with the second hole because uh, it is pretty painful. Again, there's a little video on, uh, on YouTube if you want to take a look at that. 
All right, so that's the, the first three little blocks. The last one is uh, some medical legal considerations. I put this in here because it is important and we don't really get a whole lot of education on this. Um, so I wanted to you know, dedicate a little bit of time and just go through some important aspects. Now, we, we don't practice medicine to avoid getting sued, but if you have some of those things in the back of your mind, it does make you a better clinician and you're thinking about those things. So um, we're gonna go through a couple little, uh, little aspects from a medical legal uh, standpoint. Now, I was putting together my course, I was looking at reasons that people get sued for lacerations. And surprisingly, it's not because of cosmetic outcome. And you know, I think the possibly the reason uh, that is, is because people can always go and get scar revisions. You can get, you know, you can see a plastic surgeon and, uh, and, uh, and have a scar taken care of. But the reason that people sue is, uh, is several fold. Failure to diagnose something failure to treat that, and they often go hand in hand. And the bottom line is that you can't find something if you don't look for it. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Uh, some other things that, uh, that raise concern are failure to provide for adequate recommendations and follow-up, um, when to consult and when to transfer. You know, in the urgent care setting, we don't have access to every subspecialty. We, you know, we don't have plastic surgery. We don't have orthopedics readily available in-house. Um, so you do have to know when to consult and when to transfer patients to a higher level of care. Uh, and then lastly, if you don't document it, it didn't happen. So it is important whenever you're looking at lacerations to mention several of the key things, you know, passive range of motion, uh, range of motion against resistance, no foreign bodies, uh, you know, um, distal perfusion intact after repair or reduction. So those are little buzzwords that you need to include in your documentation um, so that one, the patient gets better care, but also if anything does, you know, if there is a bad outcome, um, your documentation is really the only thing that you can go on. Uh, so it's important to keep that stuff in there. All right, so associated fractures. Um, you know, if you've got a laceration, they were uh, cutting avocados or onions in their kitchen and they've got, uh, you know, a laceration to the end of their finger. Well, you probably don't need to get it, uh, a radiograph of that because the mechanism doesn't support the likelihood of there, of there being a fracture. Um, now, if there's any crush injuries, car doors, um, you know, whatever reason, if there's a, a crush mechanism with it, um, you, you should be getting an x-ray. Um, if there's a subungual hematoma, um, consider getting an x-ray, making sure that there's not a tough fracture or nail bed fracture. Um, now, I think everybody I'm sure knows this, uh, laceration plus fracture equals open fracture. And um, just because there's an open fracture doesn't necessarily mean that the patient needs to be transferred to an emergency department with orthopedic coverage. Um, However, it does warrant at least consulting the orthopedist to discuss it. Um, as I've aged and gained more experience, and you know, sometimes it just depends on, on where you work, uh, but now in a, a more of a rural uh, emergency department setting, um, our orthopedists uh, do a great job in getting the patient in either that day or the next day. So they're not going to be in residency. The orthopedic residents would come in and they would manage these things and they would take them to the OR. They would do all kinds of stuff. But now in the community setting, um, it's just, it's important to have that relationship to reach out to them. And oftentimes they'll just say, okay, that's fine. Just put a couple of sutures in it, uh, put a splint, give them some antibiotics and I'll see them in the office this afternoon or tomorrow. Um, so it doesn't mean that they have to go to the emergency department. Um, they don't need to be admitted in the hospital every single time. Uh, but it does warrant a consultation. So have a good relationship with your local orthopedic team uh, for things like this. Whoops. All right, so missed foreign bodies. This is another reason that, uh, that people end up getting sued. Um, not all foreign bodies show up on plain films. Glass is probably one of the more common things. And um, glass fragments that are two millimeters and larger will show up on, on plain films, uh, by and large. You can oftentimes feel within, you know, after the, the wound has been anesthetized, you can sometimes feel small foreign bodies, little tiny pieces of gravel or wood or glass or metal 
uh, that you might not be able to see you know, visually. So it is important to look, listen, and, and feel uh, for foreign bodies. Uh, but if, if you're in doubt, you know, order imaging, it's okay. Uh, nobody's going to come down on you for ordering the x-ray. They're gonna come down on you if you don't and you miss something. So if you have a concern clinically that there may be some foreign body there, go ahead and just order the x-ray, it's okay. Uh, now, not all things show up on x-ray. I don't think most urgent cares have, uh, you know, MRI and, and whatnot readily available. Um, but if there is a concern for something, um, you know, they may need to be referred over for advanced imaging. Um, another concern with foreign bodies is that they can migrate. So if you've got an injury with concern for foreign body in an area, you know, close proximity to any nerves or blood vessels, uh, that's another reason to you know, kind of have a, a heightened sense of awareness and curiosity as to what you need to do to, uh, to evaluate that. Um, you know, it, it's okay to attempt to remove, but I think the biggest thing is you know, first do no harm. Um, you don't want to start you know, tearing up somebody's foot uh, looking for a small foreign body. Uh, and sometimes these are the ones that you do need to uh, send patients for uh, consultation for follow-up um, you know, in the office with either podiatrist, general surgeon, or an orthopedic surgeon for fur further evaluation. But the bottom line is that you have to at least recognize the fact that a foreign body is a possibility and document that you look for them and no foreign bodies were seen, proper imaging was obtained, et cetera. All right, so uh, when to consult and transfer? You know, from the urgent care setting, we are limited with our resources and the capabilities that we've got. And there are definitely times when patients will walk in and they've got something that we, that we can't handle in the urgent care setting. So if there is multi-trauma, other associated injuries, you know, loss of consciousness, chest trauma, abdominal trauma, uh, those are all indications to definitely be transferring the patient out. Uh, for kids, if there's a need for procedural sedation, you know, if there's uh, any uh, special needs, autism and things like that, where they are really gonna need some extra tender loving care, definitely uh, you'll wanna get those to a higher level of care. If the repairs can be taking you longer than 30 to you know, 60 minutes, um, you know, I, I think most emergency departments are very, very, very understanding of that. And that the urgent care uh, setting is just not designed for that uh, type of a, uh, an extensive repair. Now, if there's any concern for nerve, vascular, um, you know, joint injuries, difficult to remove foreign bodies, those types of things. And then lastly, um, a high pressure injection injury. If you haven't ever seen those, um, they can be very subtle, um, but they are uh, pretty significant injuries. There's a ton of pressure. Uh, there can be some very caustic materials that get injected with pressure washers, uh, paint injection or uh, paint spraying machines and things like that. So whenever you've got a high pressure injection injury, those are uh, things that you don't want to mess around with, and those, those definitely need to be uh, sent to a higher level of care. Now, if you are transferring, uh, here's a couple points that I just want to go through with real quick. From my experience and from what I hear uh, from other you know, emergency physicians and when I was working in the urgent care setting, it's very important that the urgent care clinician calls and, and speaks to the person who is going to be receiving that patient in the emergency department, whether it's the physician or uh, PA or nurse practitioner, whoever it is that is you know, kind of manning that phone uh, for transfers in the emergency department, it's very important for you to call and speak to them. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've gotten a call from uh, either a nurse or a medical assistant who really doesn't know anything about the patient uh, calling to tell me that the patient is coming over. Um, and, we might not have the service that the, that the patient truly needs. So it is important for you to be the one to make that phone call, if at all possible. Um, they need to have a copy of any imaging with a transcription of that imaging, if possible. Um, again, you wanna make sure that they have the proper service. If they're sending a patient over for, uh, you know, a, a periorbital injury, well, we don't have ophthalmology. They need to go elsewhere. Um, you know, we may not have the ability to do procedural sedation at night. Uh, so they need to go to a place that does have pediatric services, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and then lastly, don't, you know, and we all do this, I do this myself. Um, you know, we, we can't promise the patient what is going to be done or not done. It, it paints people into a corner and um, um, they may not end up needing what you think that they need. Um, and uh, so it's just important to not, um, you know, raise expectations as, as to what's going to be done. 
Uh, if there is going to be a delay, you can consider irrigating the wound out, bandaging it, giving them a dose of some antibiotics and, and updating their tetanus. Uh, lastly, I think, yes, we've got the, the most important thing probably from a medical legal standpoint is follow up. Um, if a patient does not hear from you or the nurse about what to do next, they're going to be confused and they may end up making some bad uh, decisions and overlooking things. So I think whenever you're going through discharge instructions, who to follow up with, when, where they need to go, provide the address and the phone number, uh, what they need to look for as a reason to come back to you sooner for a wound check, uh, and, and kind of the same thing there, why they should return. So uh, with your discharge instructions, these are the things that are very important for lacerations. Um, I think that wraps up everything from the webinar. Um, I'm just going to throw this out here and then we're going to go in and do some Q&A. Uh, I've been very, very, very fortunate. I'm very excited to, to partner with Kaluka uh, to offer the laceration course um, discount for Kaluka members. Um, if you go to the lacerationcourse.com, you can enter the code Kaluka and there's a $50 off uh, coupon for the CME course. Uh, the course itself, it's got seven lectures. Uh, there's a lot of uh, kind of the basics, the core information that you really need to know and some advanced topics and techniques. There's videos on different suturing techniques and it does come with CME credit for AMA uh, CME credit. Um, if you purchase the course, it also comes with a free practice suture kit. It's one of, one of the gel uh, silicone gel type things with all these preformed lacerations, instruments, and sutures, so you can practice some of these techniques at home. Um, I've also got a Facebook group uh, that you can join to discuss the course, any questions, cases, techniques. There's some additional content there on social media, um, and if any of you are part of a, uh, you know, an urgent care group, um, if there's any interest in doing any group discounts for all of your clinicians, just reach out to me and we'll come up with a, with a discount there. Uh, but more, more importantly, I want to serve as a resource to all of you for laceration topics. Um, my contact information is right here. I'd love to connect with you. If there's anything that I can do to be of service, uh, don't hesitate to reach out. And uh, again, thank you for the opportunity. And we'll, uh, we'll do some Q&A. Super, super. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, let me make sure I'm unmuted here. Fantastic presentation. I, I was just, uh, I was really enthralled. Uh, really, really amazing. I'm, I'm sure our viewers are going to walk away with a lot of really very, very useful uh, tips. And, you know, all, along the lines, I just want to mention that we will send out a, a follow-up email. I think okay. uh, you mentioned you're going to share some, some yeah. additional little nuggets that people can, uh, mm -hmm. so some of this information here at the very end, the contact info and all that kind of stuff, we'll include in an email to go out, say in the next 48 hours, something like that okay. to all of our uh, Kaluka members. So they can uh, keep an eye out for that. And uh, just real quick, we only have just a couple of minutes, going to try and respect okay. everybody's uh, everybody's lunch hour here. But um, just real quick, um, I know in the urgent care, we work with a lot of mid-level providers mm -hmm. and some mm -hmm. of them are, you know, a little bit of trepidation and, you know, that kind of stuff like that. Just, you know, real, real quickly, what, what do you see based on your experience are the things that will prop up and build that confidence and, and our mid-levels and our PAs and, and NPs in dealing with these kinds of suture things? You know, what part of your course really can, you know, has the most value in there for just, you know, building them up a little bit? The... In, in my experience with, with doing this, um, I've, I've kind of come up with this little tagline of it's 90% knowledge and 10% suturing skill. You know, we can, I can teach my son, my eight-year-old son, how to tie knots, but it's the knowledge that gives you the confidence on how do I, you know, how do I approach the wound? Just kind of the general uh, approach. When I see a laceration, what do I need to know? What do I need to look for? Um, what uh, materials am I going to need? When do I need to leave that, uh, that laceration alone and not do anything? You know, kind of the don't just do something, stand there. Um, you know, knowing what lacerations uh, need uh, uh, thermobond versus stereostrips versus staples versus sutures. So I really try to provide throughout the entire course the knowledge that you need to feel more comfortable and confident so that in the middle of your shift, you're not looking on you know, 15 different, you're not Googling every single, uh, you know, step of the process. So it's really, a, a, I call it a comprehensive uh, review of what you need to know to be able to uh, manage the laceration that walks in your door. So, yeah, it sounds like, uh, you know, the topics that you have in, in your course really uh, will, will, will help 
uh, will help with that because definitely oh, yeah. the, yeah. it's very, yeah. very con content mm -hmm. rich uh, and will help with the decision making and all those things that, that, that you talk about there. So, you know, in the urgent care business, you know, patient experience is, uh, is everything. So, uh, you know, you know, you know uh, pr presenting yourself as a, as a knowledgeable, competent, right. capable provider is, is hugely important. Very, very. If, it's, you're, it's, if you're fumbling around and dropping things and, you know, patients can sense, and families can sense our, um, our confidence level and our discomfort level with what we've got. And you have little beads of sweat starting to come down your forehead. Patients, yeah, you know, I mean, they, they pick up on that. So I really want people to come through after they finish this course, I think that their confidence level will be significantly improved. And then the bottom line, it's, you got to get in there. You just got to, you got to start doing it, uh, practicing, even if it's on, uh, you know, a, a pig's foot or a silicone pad or whatnot, but you, ju you just got to do it. You got to practice it. Super, super. Well, thanks again. You know, when we could probably be on here for a lot longer, but uh, unfortunately, we, we are we are out of time for today. But again, I want to remind everyone to uh, to go and look up Dr. O'Malley's course at the laceration course dot com. There's a wealth of information and it's got some videos that go in depth on you know what the content of the course is. It, it's fantastic. And uh, there is a discount code there. Just put in Kaluka uh, and it's also CME approved. So, um, you know, you can't go wrong with that. So once again, thank you so much, Dr. Malley, Absolutely. for joining us. We look forward to seeing you again in the future. Would love and, to. Uh, we'll be talking to you soon. Yeah. And right. thanks, everybody, for uh, from uh, for joining us today and uh, look out for our uh, next presentation, uh, uh, Urgent Care Town Hall in December, middle of December, where you'll see uh, an, an email uh, announcing the uh, speaker for that. So thanks very much, everyone. Have a great day. Awesome. Thank you, everybody.